despite our attempts to have less technological glitches yesterday, um, that didn't work out. Um, the internet didn't really work until Matthew was sitting on the floor. So uh, I'm just going to do a little retake of the first half of the class so that it is less glitchy and you can understand me better. So we are on to Living Composers. Um, and Living Composers is really exciting, particularly for me. Um, you know, growing up, you think of composers as these people that are long dead, right? Like they don't exist anymore, but I just love the idea of being a composer, but oh, you know. So, but with living composers, it's like, it didn't matter what gender they were, it was exciting because it's still happening. People are still writing music. And so that just gets me excited all the time. And then I get even more excited when they're women because it means that what I'm doing isn't just trying to, you know, be one of the boys, I can be a composer myself. And that's just very exciting for me. Um, so the two that we're talking about today have um, very, um, very established careers, like they, you know, they have that notoriety and um, acceptance that we would have seen with like Beethoven and those guys, and they're women, and they're living today. So um, they're very exciting. So the, the women I've chosen for today, also a lot of the music that they wrote is in, um, or the earlier career or mid-career for, for Sophia would have been in like the 1980s and that sort of 20th century music. So I thought I would just do a little tiny overview about 20th century music, particularly for those who are not, um, who are new to the classical music world or don't know much about it. Um, so in the 20th century, we had this huge move away from common tonality. And so that's like those nice chords that you hear in, in music. Um, and even in the Romantic era with um, all of the additional chromatics and everything, it's still very tonal music. Um, but then in the 20th century, it's it, the composers start to kind of go away from that, particularly um, Arnold Schoenberg, Alban Berg, and Anton Webern. Um, it was kind of like this dissolution of, um, of tonality and they do what's called 12 tone music where they're using all 12 uh, chromatic pitches of the Western scale. And um, yeah, and the way that they, they build music is more experimental. Um, we see like lots of extended techniques being used on instruments. So say with a guitar, you're doing like scratches on the strings and you're knocking on the body of the guitar instead of creating pitches in the in the conventional set sense of things. Um, we also have, you know, like the avant-garde, everything is kind of new and um, that, that's a lot of what we're hearing in the 20th century. Um, so uh, I just want to give this little quote. I, I didn't reference where it was from, so I have, I do not remember where I grabbed this quote, but I love it. Um, so what's easier to listen to very often becomes more popular. So that's our tonal music. And this is very unfair to many pieces. Um, earlier in the quote, he says, except accessible music is often, oops, um, but the other pieces, which are more complex, so our avant-garde or our um, experimental musics, um, you need greater efforts to listen to, but you get greater rewards too. So the first composer that we're talking about is Sofia Gubaidalina. She was born in 1931 in Kristopol in the Republic of Tatarstan. And this is in the Soviet Union. So I want to talk just a little bit about the Soviet Union because this is the backdrop of where Sofia is growing up. Um, so the Soviet Union was in power from 1922 to 1991, and Stalin was actually ruling during um, Sofia's lifetime, which was the mid-1930s to 1953. Um, under the Soviet rule, um, freedom of information was this alien concept. They controlled what you heard, what you learned through the media, um, you know, they they ordained the truth, which might not actually be actual truth. Um, there's a lot of propaganda going on towards um, the Soviet ideals um, and and whatnot. Um, the citizens there they were ruled by terror. People were killed um, if they if they fell out of line with the Soviet rule. Um, you didn't have the right to travel. Like you couldn't leave the Soviet Union unless they said so. Um, there is this one Russian performer, uh, last name Ashkenazi, Ashkenazi, 
Um, and he, he left the Soviet Union because they allowed him to go on a performance tour in Britain in 1963. Happily for him, his wife and child were with him on the tour, so they just didn't go back and they escaped. So that was good for them. Um, so that sort of, we're seeing some of this. Um, there are a lot of efforts that were taken to sort of draw these artists into the propaganda campaign. Um, and they were expected to write in this, uh, socialist, socialist realism. And it's this idea of realistic art where you are reflecting back what is happening in society. And it's supposed, um, pardon me, um, it's like this, they, they want it to be this faithful mirror of life. But with the Soviet Union, they wanted you to reflect what they thought reality should be. Um, so the, there's these principles that, uh, they, that they sort of had guidelines for, but they were never truly formulated. Um, so there was often quite a bit of question as to is that what I'm writing actually following the rules or are they going to get mad at me? Um, and so some of these were kind of like they, they wanted the music to be comprehensive, um, accessible. So i.e. not avant-garde, not experimental. Um, they even wanted you to avoid experiments. Um, and they also wanted you to cultivate this national characteristic in the music. Um, they wanted it to be optimistic because then it was showing you had all of this faith in the communist ideals. Um, but the Soviet composers whose music deviated from the ideals of social realism risked harsh punishment. Um, for example, Shostakovich and Prokofiev were publicly denounced by the Soviet Union in 1948. Um, they were accused of writing inaccessible music and of being anti narodia which means anti-people. So after their denunciation, their performances were banned. Um, they were not allowed to write music. Well, I mean, they could but probably get in trouble um, unless they took these commissions from the Soviet authorities, which would have been pro-Stalin music. Um, and they were even warned by some fellow composers like, you know, watch your back, look out. If you don't uh, follow the rules, there was a really good chance they could have been arrested by the MGB, which was a predecessor of the KGB. So on to, so on to Sophia. So this is, this is the world, this is the backdrop that she is growing up in. Um, so the Republic of Tatar was a Muslim enclave in the Southern European Russia. Um, and her family was actually quite poor. Um, her father was a surveying engineer, but this did not mean the same as it does today. Um, they, they did not make much money, um, but he was the son of an imam. So a, uh, a Muslim priest is my best ignorant Western um, definition of that. You're welcome. Uh, and then her Russian mother was uh, from a Christian family um, and she was also a teacher. And so the family, and I'm, I'm, I'm mentioning the religion because it's very important, especially with Sophia. She, she herself was actually a very religious person. Um, so the family actually, and oh, and her, her parents were not, they, by that point, from what I've read, um, they were secular. Um, so like they were kind of trying to hold back because in the Soviet Union, um, they, they didn't want to promote religion. They were trying to, um, they wanted to promote more of a state atheism. And so while they didn't publicly, or they, they didn't, they didn't outright prohibit you from worshiping. Um, you could if privately in a church or a mosque or a synagogue, but they did not allow for public religious expression. Um, and, but, and even though they said they were allowing these private um, ceremonies um, in 1930, out of the 12,000 mosques in Tatarstan, more than 10,000 were closed. So uh, they're not overly accepting of, of the religious of the of religions, despite what they say. So um, Sophia's family actually lived in fear for a lot of her childhood because of religious persecution. And again, it's not because her, her parents were still practicing, but simply because her father was the son of an imam, they were persecuted. Um, so on, on to her, her growing up. So in her childhood years, uh, she spent in the city Katzan or Kazan. Uh, and uh, so since they were they were living in poverty, like she didn't have toys, she didn't have books, there's no journeys to the countryside. Um, and 
the environment was actually pretty uninteresting. Um, their, their yard was pretty bleak. There was no grass except for a couple patches and there was no trees, which was something Sophia really longed for. She really wanted some trees. Um, so as a child, she was pretty bored. Um, but as a result, she took to her imagination. She was just fascinated with the clouds passing by. Um, so she just lived up there. She lived in her imagination. Um, we kind of hear more about her, her creativity when she was uh, starting to play music, uh, they had a concert piano um, and she just loved that you could lift up the lid and you could look inside or you could sit underneath the piano and you could hear just how differently everything sounded. Uh, when she was in school, she was once given a piano piece that only had two octaves of music. And she just thought, well, you have all the rest of this instrument, what a, what a, what a waste. What, why didn't you use all of the instrument? And so she's, uh, she says, well, if humanity was so barren, I would start composing myself. Um, so at the end, there's this is, um, documentary that I found on YouTube. Um, and she says, you know, it's very strange that something so good could come out of poverty. And for her, it was that she could be a composer. She could create. Um, so she did this herself. She found, you know, she found that goodness out of not good. Um, so as I, I had mentioned earlier, religion was this very important part of Sophia's life. Um, so she came late to the religion, but she um, went into the Orthodox faith, the Christian faith. Um, and in the 60s and 70s, you actually see the sort of slow, gradual acceptance of her faith coming out of her music. Um, in, in an interview in 1998, she says, I've never written any non-religious pieces. So it's very important for her. It's very much, it's it's her work, right? Um, but what's really neat is that um, she'll have like choral themes or, or church bells and things like that. Um, these ideas of hope and of faith, but she has them in the context of this like dark and ambiguous textures in her music. And so by doing that, it creates this huge contrast so that, you know, the light things, the joy, it seems more joyous. And then um, yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty cool. Her music is amazing. So as for her formal studies, she's, uh, studied at the Kazan Conservatory shortly after the Second World War. Um, her, there, her and her fellow students, they, uh, obtained some contraband music scores of, uh, music by Hindemith and by Cage and the renegade Shostakovich. Oof. Uh, so she graduated in 1954, and up until that point, any sort of suspect tendencies in her music seemed to have gone unnoticed. So she uh, then went on to complete her education at the Moscow Conservatory between 1954 and 1963, where she studied with Nikolai Paiko. And while there, she also met Philip Herchkowitz, who was a pupil of Anton Webern, one of those 20th century non-tonal experimental uh, composers that we talked about earlier. Not very Soviet friendly, don't you think? Uh, so Hershkowitz was this vital source of information and instruction to young com Russian composers, um, especially anything non-Russian because it was, you know, pretty much condemned from the state. Um, so he, he introduced these composers to those of the second Viennese school. And the second Viennese school is this like, um, 12 tone, non tonal music school. So your Schoenbergs, Arn, Webern's, all that. And then the first Viennese school is like your Beethoven's, your Haydn's, that sort of thing. Um, but uh, Hertzschwitz also introduced them to, um, he also did discussions about Bach and Mozart and, and our first Viennese school gentleman. Um, and Sophia really took to the German art. She loved Bach, she loved Webern, and she also loved like Goethe. Um, and so these, these are things that you kind of see in her music as well. So at Moscow Conservatory, started to be realized that uh, they were maybe a little indifferent to the social realism. And at, at one point, the professors at Moscow, they, you know, they warned her, you know, like that she had this unacceptable departure from the required style. But of those uh, people, Shostakovich goes to her and very, very privately expresses to Sophia that she would, he hoped that she would continue on her incorrect course. 
thank you, Shostakovich. Um, so be and and this really stuck with her, and she did. She kept writing in her own way, in, in the incorrect way. And uh, but as a result, her works were rarely played in Russia, and they were never published. Um, she was considered to be avant-garde. She had these religious themes, and so all of this was the equivalent of being anti-Soviet. Um, so in order to make a living, she wrote music for film. Um, and since there was there was little performance opportunities for her work, um, and also there was like very little published music that she related to that she'd like to play through, uh, she founded this impro improvisational group with two other music composers, um, and they called it Astrea, which, um, if I remember correctly, is one of the last Roman Greco gods to leave Olympus. Pretty cool. Um, and so anyway, one of the uh, other composers in this, in Estrella, uh, was an ethnomusicologist, and he had a collection of folk instruments from Russia and from Central Asia. Um, and so you see a lot of these uh, different uh, instruments in their improvisation. Um, so I cannot figure out how to share a YouTube video on here, um, but I'll just post in the comments the little clip that I shared at this point in the episode, and you can check out the clip yourself of uh, a video of them improvising at somebody's home. Um, they also would um, sometimes make their own instrumental inventions. And uh, there was this thing they called a friction rod, and it was these rubber balls attached to metal rods. Um, and I didn't get a chance to share this in the class either, but again, share it in the comments. Um, and it's the string quartet number four, where you actually hear a feature of this. And so in the recording, how it is, um, you know, the performance recording, um, so there's the live performers, but then in the background, there's this taped music. And as I understand, um, that's where these metal rods are being played on, on the instrument. So, like Shostakovich, Sofia suffered for her non-compliance, and she received official condemnation from the Soviet Union in 1980. But, in contrast to Shostakovich, Sofia found artistic freedom in being blacklisted and unperformed in the Soviet Union. And she says, I could write what I wanted without compromise. Um, so, I'm just going to move on to... So one of her biggest pieces to get uh, widespread recognition was her violin concerto Offertorium. Um, this was supposed to be premiered in 1981 in Venice by Guidon Kramer. So he's a, a violinist, obviously it's a concerto, um, but the Soviet authorities almost prevented its premiere. Um, but happily, love this, um, her Western publisher, Jürgen Kuckel, smuggled the score out of the country. That is so cool. <laughs> so yeah, smuggles it out, gets it to Venice, premiere goes ahead, does great. And um, Kramer went on to uh, perform it across the world with leading orchestras and it was uh, recorded in like 1989. So pretty cool. Um, see below for my clips about Offertorium. Um, the first clip that I start with how um that i show it's this little piccolo part um and just kind of listen to that get that in your ears give yourself like 15 seconds and then skip to the next timestamp. um and then that's her putting it into the violin part which is really cool um listen for as long as you want it's beautiful i love it um but then what i do, did was i skipped ahead to the third timestamp, um and this part of the music is just gorgeous like it's it's so beautiful um yeah You'll notice if you watch the original video, um, I almost fell out of my chair when I put that on. It, it's not because I was blown over by the music, but just because I almost fell out of my chair. <laughs> but I had to do that. It's so funny. Who falls out of their chair? <laughs> okay. So, post listening to the song. Um, so in 1991, the, as we know, the Soviet Union lost power, um, dissolved, goodbye. Um, and with this came out all of this music that had been sort of hidden before. Um, all of the, they were, it was sort of an unofficial generation of composers. It was underground movement. Um, Sophia was a part of this. Um, and so when, then all these names were coming out and uh, the rest of the world got to hear about the music of uh, Alfred Schnittke, Edison Denisov, and Avril Part, and of course, Sofia. 
uh, pretty cool. Uh, train of thought. Okay. So yeah, so when, once the USSR um, crumbled, uh, a lot of composers who were stuck there, they left and they found new homes. And Sophia did the same thing in 1992 when she moved to Hamburg, Germany, and she still lives there today. Um, so she has been commissioned and recorded by the Kronos Quartet, the Arditi Quartet, violinist and Sophie Mutter, and the Berlin Phil, the New York Phil, uh, Boston Symphony. She holds honorary doctorates from both Yale University and the University of Chicago. Um, she has gotten many awards in 2013 uh, at the Venice Biennial Music Festival. She was awarded the Golden Lion Award for Lifetime Achievement. Go Sophia! Yes! Um, and I'll just end this little bit about her um, or this little quote that she says, there's no more serious reason for composing music than spiritual renewal. So please enjoy some uh, music by Sofia Gubaidolina. You will not be disappointed. Um, like take some time, like give yourself a good half an hour, 45 minutes, get a good pair of headphones or some speakers, um, get a good cup of coffee, whatever, and just sit back and listen and you will just be taken on this amazing musical journey. Um, yeah, it's so good. And uh, you may now continue watching the rest of the episode, which now turned out. As the 20th century is going on, and we have all of this avant-garde music happening, we also have uh, like the advent of music technology. We have uh, like the gramophone, and we move into cassette tapes, well, I guess eight tracks, and then cassette tapes, and all of that. Um, and so as a result, composers were using this technology to experiment some more and explore what else they could do with music. Um, so like in the 1960s, there were um, a few composers, what they would do is they would um, take recordings from, from tape um, and then they would splice the tape and then kind of tape it back together in different configurations and uh, do yeah, lots of experiments like that. Uh, I forget the piece name, but there's one by Milton Babbitt that does like just that playing with, with the cassette tapes there. Um, and then in the mid 1970s, uh, we have the development of electronic instruments. Uh, we have the synthesizers, um, you know, we have the, the dawn of the computer and then there's MIDI, which is the musical, inters musical instrument digital interface, which is a language that allows these synthesizers and these computers to talk to one another. Um, we get samplers, we get sensors, and these are just more ways for composers to really dig into when well, we talk um, into sound, sound. I think it'll make more sense when we are talking about uh, Kaya Serieho. Um, one and one thing I kind of noticed when I was listening to some of this electro, I had to go outside music. of my comfort for zone me, to learn about this. It's so worth it because it's it's fascinating what's been done. Um, and so what I I sort of noticed, and this is my own. This is my own observation. I don't know if this is truth, but I found with electroacoustic comp composers, they seemed more willing to experiment with form. So like that idea of, you know, we have the sonata form or the ABAA song, those kind of things. Like they're very just kind of traditional forms um, that those of us in the typical classical world kind of get into. But um, with, yeah. With those who are experimenting with the electronics and whatnot, they find these really creative ways to come up with stuff. And we'll see that when we get to a piece by Kaya in a bit here. So in the vein of developing technology, I found this great little interview um, of Kaya Siriejo talking about using computers in the 1980s. Um, I mean, the interview isn't from then, it's from now. Um, but yeah, it's, it's quite good. So. When I went to IRCAM in 1982, there was very big computer also we were working with, it was PDP-10. Of course, the way of working and the, the slowness, uh, all is something that when I tell about it to young people of today, they 
they just pity me that I've spent all that time for doing not much. Well, when we think about that period when we worked with the big PDP-10, that was um, in one sense, of course, uh, very nice life. Because uh, we, st we started, uh, we prepared some calculation, we went to have dinner, we went to movies, then we came back, we, we came to have a look if the calculation is still running. If it was running, we went home to sleep and we came next morning to see if it had, was still, was it well finished, did we have one beep <laughs> or not. <laughs> and if not, then we, we started new calculation and then we went home to sleep. Well, this, of course, today uh, cannot happen because uh, the, everything is more or less real time. I never like when somebody says, I'm using a um, computer because it makes things go quicker. I don't like the idea. I don't think it should go quicker. I think uh, if for something we must really take much time, it's uh, making art. So who is this wonderful woman that we just heard speaking? So she is Kaya Siriejo. She is a Finnish composer who was born in 1952 um, and she, oh, and in Helsinki. Um, so her family didn't actually have much of a musical background. Her father worked in the metal industry, not the heavy metal industry. <laughs> yeah. Um, and <laughs> Sorry, guys. And her mother looked after three children. Um, but Kaya herself was very musical. She had lots of music in her mind. Um, and she, actually, when she was very small, she imagined that it came from her pillow. And so when she couldn't sleep, she would ask her mother to turn off her pillow so you know she could get back to sleep. Um, she says, I had sensitivity to surrounding sounds. The sounds much from the nature, from climate conditions, the coldness of the weather, the snow, the acoustics of contrasting nature has had an effect on what she sounds. Um, so as yeah, she, the violin, piano, guitar, as she got older, she went and studied at the Sibelius Academy in Helsinki at the Rudolf Steiner School. And there she studied with Pavel Heinenen. And studying at Sibelius Academy was this fulfillment of, of young Kaya's ambition. Um, but it only came about because of her own self <laughs> and, and stubbornness. Um, she really wanted to be in, in Heinenen's class, but it had been full. So she decided she was not going to leave the room until he took her in as a pupil. And you know, he, he kept telling her, you know, there isn't any room in the class, but she wouldn't leave. And so finally he had no choice and she became his pupil. So in the 1970s, she was the only woman in her class. And there were some teachers that actually wouldn't teach her because they thought teaching a woman was a waste of time. But nonetheless, she persisted. She knew she wanted to be a composer. And as a composer, she did not want her music to be. At the academy, there was um, often a lot of pr uh, pressure to conform to what was called like the conventional archetype of modernism. I realize that sounds like an oxymoron. It's not. Um, and actually, we still see a lot of that today with uh, some composition professors. They really want their students to just pretty much be images of themselves. And they, they really sort of pressure them to really experiment with avant-garde, even if it's not, you know, their own sound. And it's going to be challenged. But... Um, yeah, lots of people find that composition school, certain composition schools aren't quite for them because, yeah, they get this pressure to write in a way that they're not wanting to write. So it's, it's nothing new. Um, anyway, so after, after Sibelius, she studied at the Musical School in Freiburg with uh, Brian Fernie Howe and Klaus Huber. But when she was studying with Fernie Howe, she uh, just sort of thought, his music was very over-systemized, um, sort of, and, and the reasons that things were in the music, she couldn't quite see what it was, why it was there. There was no real reason for it to be in the music beyond experimentation, um, but she wanted there to, 
you know, for it to be an, an expression and for there to be a reason for it to be there in the music. Um, you know, a, a really good oral, oral result. result. Um, but while she was studying there, though, she met two French spectralists. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, they were named Gérard Grisset and Tristan Murray. Um, and, through, and so then after that, she took a, com a computer course in Paris at IRCAM, which is the Institut de Recherche et de Coordination Acoustique Musique. Um, and this is where she found the ideal environment for the development of her musical ideas. Um, and, and she worked here throughout the 1980s. So a little bit on, on spectralism, as I understand it, it's this practice involving looking at the spectra of music, like they analyze it through a computer program. Um, and it's, it's sort of like it's looking at the sounds between the normal 12 chromatic pitches that we know. So like all those tones between the C and the C sharp, like they're looking at that. Um, and all of the depth to a sound too, like just because you hear a C, it's not just C that you're hearing, you're also hearing like the overtone series. So like you hear C and then you hear the octave above and then you hear the G, C again, and then E and so on. And they really look at um, all of those sorts of things. And by like 2000s, spectralists sort of, they really focus on timbre, which is like the color of sound. So anyway, that's like my best way to describe spectralists as I understand it. So on IRCAM, uh, it was this underground, well, it was called like an underground labyrinth of the electroacoustic experiments. Um, and it was underneath the Pompidou Center in Paris. Um, so while they were working there, a lot of the individuals, um, they combined scientific inquiry into components of sound and um, they used it sort of create pitch generation. Um, one thing we see in the 20th century, it's what's called serialism. This isn't necessarily serial serialism, but that's the idea of um, getting sort of a randomization, randomization of picking sounds. So like say we have dice and you assign a pitch to each number on the dice and you roll the dice and, oh, okay, I got a two, so that's an A. Oh, I got a six, so there's a B flat, you know, that kind of a thing. Um, that's a really basic look at that. So this little piece from an article should hopefully make more sense about what we're talking about here. Uh, so Siriejo took an analytic approach to composing, learning techniques based on computer analysis of the sound spectrum. And it was this approach that inspired the development of her own harmonic method. She would use her extraordinarily sensitive ears to pick up on the tones and pitches that are constantly around us, but that exist below the threshold of conscious awareness. She was particularly interested in the sounds of the natural world, such as wind blowing or waves crashing. Once she had identified these subtle sounds, ranging from pure tone to unpitched noise, Siriejo would use detailed notation incorporating harmonics and microtonality, so that's those you know, pieces between the C and the C sharp, to allow an ensemble of instruments to voice them. And so she took this really like microscopic focus to her music. So one of the first pieces that she wrote at IRCAM was called Vers le Blanc, and I couldn't find a recording for it, sorry. Um, but how it's described is it's, it's for a string ensemble and it's slow glissandi from changing from one harmony to the other, and I think it's about seven minutes. Um, and for those of you who don't know, a glissandi is um, sort of sliding up from one note to the other, just and, and catching all of those little tones in between. I like think of a trombone going that kind of thing. And so anyway, so with the sliding, the move, the glissandi that she's using in Ver Le Blanc, the changing of the harmony, the harmony is almost imperceptible. And only intermittently do you kind of realize that it's changing. She does it so slow. Um, really wish I could have found that piece. Um, and then two other pieces that she worked on there and um, were using the combination of electronic sound and acoustic instruments. And those two pieces were Verblendungen and Lichtbogen. And um, yeah, this really opened up a way for how she could get those things to work. Um, yeah, so she, um, she uses, and moving on, we're gonna talk Verblendungen in a bit, but to sort of help us get an understand, or help me <laughs> get an understanding 
for what all of this kind of means. Um, this one piece I found was really helpful in understanding sort of her thought on things. Um, so it's an all acoustic piece. It's called Oiku. Uh, she wrote it in 1990 and she's using timbre so that different changes of sound as a way of creating form to the piece. And the listener's concentration is on these ever-changing colors. She uses lots of different extended techniques with her two instruments. And it is for cello and bass flute. Oh, so good. Um, so they, they mimic and they amplify each other. And in the piece, um, there's moments where you can't always necessarily tell who is making what sound. It is really cool. So change set up for just like a teeny little bit here to do a little example of the next thing we're going to talk about called the sound noise axis. And I thought the best way to, um, to, to describe it would be to give you a little um, example with my guitar here. Uh, okay, so the sound noise axis. So it's this idea of pure sound versus noise. Um, so a pure sound is that which is like a bell tone or um, yeah, it's like on the guitar, like a harmonic, actually no, first, yeah. Oh, my sticker. Sorry. Oh, also everybody, meet Willow. This is my guitar, Willow. We love her, okay. So a, a pure sound would be something like um, my tuning fork coming off the guitar here. That would be very much a pure sound. Um, also kind of in that would even just be like an open, an open string, right? That would also kind of be considered more of a pure sound um, or even like a harmonic, right? That would be even purer if we if we go down even more. Um, where noise is kind of where we get into things like extended techniques and that sort of stuff, um, or even adding like those little those tones that vibrato. So like if I take A and I fret it, and then I start adding some vibrato, it's just adding a little bit more noise on this on the sound spectrum. Uh, then we can even add things like this. <laughs> That would be pretty high on the on the noise spectrum, or things like those Bartok pizzicatos. That's just fun to do. Okay, anyway, sorry. Sound noise spectrum. So I hope that gives you a little idea of, of what that is. It's a very um, confusing thing in my brain, um, that particular thing. So I thought giving you a little uh, demonstration would would help with that. Okay, so this is where we start talking about Verblendengun. So this is a piece she wrote in 1982 to 1984, 
and it was written for a 34 piece orchestra and tape. So on the tape part, um, and then I, I wish I could just hear the tape part by itself, but what it is is she um, made this digital creation of sound or not digital, analog computer sound um, with a Schwarzando stroke of a bow and pizzicato. So these two different things. Um, and then the material was processed at the digital studio Group de Recherche Musicale and then finished at the Finnish Radio Ex Experimental Studio. Sorry, I've been laughing at that all day, saying Finnish at Finnish, Finnish at the Finnish school. Yeah, okay, sorry, I'm a child. There we go. Um, so how the piece works, it's got lots of little um, formal considerations in it. Um, so the, the concept is that the tape part is on, it starts at the noise sound of the spectrum on the, on the axis. And then as the piece goes on at the end, it's at the sound end of the spectrum. So it's like a more pure sound like that. Um, like our A440, oh, you can't hear it by just showing it. <laughs> um, whereas the orchestra starts in the, in the pure sounds and then moves itself to the noise sound end of the spectrum. Oh yeah, I gotta reset up my uh, headphones here. Okay. Um, and then there's another formal consideration. Like she is so smart. She takes so much detailed work into what she's writing. Um, so there's this other little, um, little bit here of, of the form, that idea that she had. So she was thinking of like this idea of a, a decrescendo you know, right from the, so very loud and then tapering off to very small. But then she also looks at it at this, um, this paintbrush stroke. So like very thick, as you can see right here and then sort of tapering off. So that's sort of another idea where she gets that form idea from. So as I, I had mentioned earlier, um, yeah, with these electro, or yeah, electroacoustic music composers, they, they're more experimental with their forms. And, and this kind of is like, that's very creative of, of thinking of that sort of sort of move and, and degradation. Um, also, if we kind of look at her mind, this is from a paper that she's published in 1987. Um, and these are other parameters that she was looking at when she was constructing this piece. So it was like, this was her idea of like curves for evolution on the tape. Um, this would be sort of the dynamics. This would be sort of harmony. She she doesn't use harmony as as we think of it in popular music or in even like old classical music. Um, she uses it to help expand on on her timbre, on her noise axis and whatnot. Um, yeah, very detailed. Like it's fascinating to me. And, and like you can see, you can you can even hear it in the way she was talking, right? Like she she takes lots of time. She doesn't think it should be a quick process to create art. Um, and actually, oh, I reached out to see if I could get some interview questions with her, but her publicist said, no, no, Miss Seriejo is, she is composing right now. So she is not taking any, any interviews. And I was like, oh, good woman. Like, I wish I could just block things out and actually devote that kind of time to my composition and to my arts. Like, ugh. and it shows like her, her music is so thoughtful and so like smart. Like I'm trying to sound smart describing it, but like I, I read two scholarly papers and I still don't understand. <laughs> anyway, we're blending good. So I'm gonna play you a bit of it here. And uh, just to give you a, a word of caution, it is very loud at the beginning. So um, prepare yourselves. Um, so yeah, it's like, oh, but you, I thought you said it was more pure sounds from the orchestra. It can still be loud and still be a pure sound. Sound. They're using um, like no vibrato when they're bowing. Um, so here we go. I'm gonna start at the beginning. It's a 13 minute piece. And so then I'll, I'll, I'll bring us to the end uh, just to show you just the difference of this axis in, in Kaya's world. All right.
forgot to mention, I think what the tape noise is, is that kind of, um, kind of scratchy sound we hear in the background. Um, at first I thought maybe it was a snare drum, um, like the snares on and just sort of rumbling, but I looked in the score and there was no notation of that. So I'll, I'll keep playing it. And just, if you can hear that sort of rattling sound, I'm, I'm very confident that's the tape sound. Okay, so now I'm just gonna skip ahead to near the end and you can hear the difference. Um, and if you listen really quick, carefully, you can hear some of these like noisy sounds coming from, from our violins. Anyway, that continues on for the um, rest of the piece. It's a tape solo, tape solo. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, guys. Uh, anyway, so uh, this is this is one of the pieces that really kind of laid this groundwork for what she would change and 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 keep doing. Uh, her her music evolved a lot throughout the '90s and the 2000s, and then now. Um, so over the course of her life, she's worked at the Electronic Studios in Helsinki. Freiburg, Paris, and Stockholm. Uh, she was a founding member, member of the Ears Open Association, which is a Finnish society that was founded in 1977 to advocate and promote contemporary music. Um, now, now Kaya lives in Paris, um, and, she has, and she has won many awards, um, including the Prix Italia, Ars Electronica Prize, and the Polar Music Prize. Um, in, the, in the 21st century, she's gotten into writing opera. Um, in 2000, uh, she wrote an opera called L'Amour de Loin. And in 2003, she won the Grawmeyer Award for Music Composition. And she was the second woman to win it. So yes, starting to break that, well, not the ceiling, but something like that. Uh, uh, she, in 2015, she uh, did a residency at UCB. So that's uh, Berkeley University in California. Um, and in 2017, she started working on another opera called Only the Sound Remains. And with this one, she's now using our modern technologies, obviously, and she's going to be transforming one of the, the one of the voices in real time with um, electronics, which is really cool. Um, I believe it was supposed to premiere this year, but because um, of COVID, it didn't. Thanks, COVID. Um, but Kaya is one of the few women who has had her music recorded and performed to wide acclaim, not to mention she has had uh, much scholarly attention on her works, which is really exciting. Um, a lot of, even though with, with the music by women that is being promoted by orchestras and ensembles and, and recorded and, and, and performed and whatnot, um, we're, we're getting that exposure, but not as much is getting that critical scholarly eye. It's not getting 
sort of that, I guess, serious treatment, if, if you want to call it that. Um, but, but her work is, there's tons of articles on it um, and, and it's really exciting. So with that, are there any questions? Can I answer some questions? Ah, so somebody is asking about how Sophia got the piano. I don't, I don't remember how she got the piano. I think they said something, she says something about it in um, that three-part documentary that I've been watching on YouTube, um, but they, they did manage to get a piano somehow. Um, I'm afraid I don't have a good enough answer for you for that, I'm sorry. Any other questions? Ah, I just started a composer class for kids and they gave us a long listening list of living composer works. It was all men. No, not good. It should be women. Um, you are more, I would, let's see, for kids, well, one person we're gonna be talking about next week is great. Her name is Chris Dirksen. Um, there's a long list of things. Um, you could, you could easily do like a Google search for like, you know, living composers that are um, exciting and what they're doing. Um, lots of places that I've sort of been looking for stuff is organizations that are promoting um, new music right now. Um, oh, I saw it on Twitter today. It's called something, listen, listen, listen. So like in, in America, there's like the American Composers Forum. In Canada, we have like uh, the Canadian Music Center. I'm going to be, I'm going to be pathetic um, at, at answering this at the precise moment. Um, but what I can do is I can post some uh, other great resources on my blog, um, on my website, kendraharder.com. Um, I'm trying to put some resources there. I can even include like some good quick places to look for, for great people, for uh, composers and whatnot. Um, and really, if you do a Google search of women composers, um, yeah, that's a good one. Oh, wonderful. Somebody here says, Emily Doolittle would be great for kids. And I agree. Actually, if, if you do podcasts, I would highly recommend the podcast, Listening to Ladies. Um, I think she did it for about two or three years, and she interviewed living composers. Amazing, amazing podcast and there's a new one that's starting to come out by women on the verge uh it's a canadian ensemble uh they recently just did a interview with cecilia livingston who's a canadian composer who i got to work with a couple of years ago she's the best thing ever um so there, there's people who are doing podcasts too and that's another really great resource um yeah a floor five boys and only two girls in my class. I didn't realize that not as many women are studying composition. Well, so what was it like for me? Um, well, my university actually didn't have a composition class, uh, co program when I was going there um, because the president before in a attempt to deal with the budget slashed programs all over the university. Like it wasn't just the arts, it was everywhere. And so the composition program was gone uh, when I got there. So, but we did try to get as much sort of composition stuff. Um, people who are seriously looking at composition, uh, there's only a handful of us. And yeah, I might've been one of, there's just a few of us women who are doing that. Um, and, and we do still see that a lot, um, but it's getting better. It's definitely getting better. Um, I definitely didn't feel discouraged though. Like I felt very encouraged to study. Uh, my guitar professor was great. He was like, your degree is what you make it. And uh, he would encourage me to write stuff for my, for my Ooh, recitals. Actually, and so that was and really cool. on teaching small children, um, look up Nilufar Nurwash. We're talking about her in the last week. She teaches children composition. Um, Any other questions? Anything about Kaya or Sophia I can attempt to answer or about music technology or the avant-garde or um, the meaning of life?
How old is the theremin? Hey, Siri. <laughs> theremin. There's a theremin concerto, though. I believe it was written by Rain, who is it? There is a theremin concerto. Anyway, invented in 1920, according to Wikipedia. Oh, who wrote that theremin concerto, though? can kill me. Also wrote the Contrabassoon Concerto. It's on a CD at the South Korean Public Library. There's a tuba concerto on it too. I think they're Finnish. Anyway, there is a Theremin Concerto and it is really cool. <laughs> I gotta find this. Okay. Theremin Concerto. Kalevi Aho. Thank you, internet. Yes. K-A-L-E-V-I. First name. Last name, A-H-O, has a theremin concerto. I am 100% confident you can find that on Naxos. If you have access to Naxos streaming um, music for those in Saskatoon, I know we have it through our public library. Uh, if you have a Saskatoon public library um, library card, <laughs> you have access to Naxos. And uh, yeah. All right, I think we are all petering off. Thank you all for um, sticking with me on this one and, and uh, yeah, for, for coming to this class, for listening to some 20th century music. I know it might be a little bit out there for some of you. Um, I'm going to look into that 20th century more tonal music and see if I can post that on my blog too. So yeah, uh, KendraHarder.com. Uh, you can find that, um, that blog. You can also follow me on social media. I am on Facebook and I am on Twitter and I try to like post stuff there with, with the class. Um, and then if you want to listen to these pieces more in depth, um, the playlist is posted on the Saskatoon Symphony Orchestra YouTube page. And I've also been posting it on my YouTube page, shameless plug. Uh, don't forget to like and share and subscribe. All right, everyone have a great night.